Hovannes S. Donabedian has been drawing and painting from the figure for more than 55 years. Hovannes only started working from nude models once he arrived in the United States in 1956, as such a practice was frowned upon where he grew up in the Middle East. During this film, as you listen to his story, you will see many examples of his drawings, collages, and paintings of the nude figure. The artist is the son of Armenian genocide survivors who settled in Palestine after the First World War, and his early years were marked by an atmosphere of upheaval and displacement. His parents went through the genocide stuff. Did your parents talk about that to you? My parents never talked about a genocide. And neither did my mother's parents. But they say it takes generations to process before people they, can really well, to face it. They didn't to talk about it. It's too traumatic. I wish they did, but they never did. To what through what they went. My father escaped genocide because a medical student in Beirut, Lebanon. He wasn't now in Turkey. My mother escaped. A Turk actually helped her to escape. He hid her under the wood they use in the train to burn, create steam. Yeah. Under a pile of wood, he hid my mother there. And she lost two children, two girls. But then she didn't know where my father was. So she searched for him and she found my father stationed in the Turkish army at the Dead Sea in Palestine. That's how they found each other. And they started their new family. Hmm. My brother, Avedis, and then uh, my sister, and then uh, me, and then Chris. Living subject to two decades of British rule in Palestine and through the Palestinian Nakba, or catastrophe, where his family found itself again displaced and in exile, Hovannes found revival and a place of refuge in drawing and painting. Drawing has always been central to Hovannes' practice of art, and he has always worked from the live model. He recently noted, since I was a small child, I was always drawing the human figure. I didn't draw still lives or landscapes. I drew the human head. Nothing else interested me. I also looked at the figure in art books and wondered if I would have the chance to work from the model. There was no politics in it, only the language of form, lines, rhythm, love for life there in front of you, the human being in all its aspects, each of us joined by a common humanity and yet unique. The singular figure, intimate, vulnerable, and always alive. In responding to the human being through graphic means, it has always been my passion to fathom the wonderful human form. Hovannes was born in the year 1924 in the village of Ramallah, just six miles north of Jerusalem during the British Mandate of Palestine. His talent for art and drawing the human figure was evident at a very young age, when at his Catholic elementary school, he'd often be asked to draw portraits at the blackboard. Hovannes likes to tell the story of the day when, in the act of drawing, someone defaced a school hallway. And some kid did their drawing on a wall, plaster wall, in the hallway. So the chief priest comes to the classroom with 30 students, pulls my ear, without saying anything, he drags me to the hallway and he said, why did you do this? He didn't even ask, did I do that? He said, why did you do this? I said, no, I didn't do it. And then, of course, frightened voice. I said, I can draw better than that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my drawing. 
And I, it was terrible drawing. <laughs> but uh, he let me go. He didn't say anything. Case dismissed. By the third grade, Havanis began attending the Ramallah Friends Boys' School founded by Quakers. His passion for art continued, and in 1940, at the age of 16, he had the opportunity to further hone his skill in painting and drawing with the arrival of a Belgian art teacher, Galene Lambert, who came to the Friends' School seeking students. Havanis, being the only one to sign up, had the benefit of individual art instruction, which gave him a strong foundation for his later creative output. When you were younger, you did some paintings that looked to me like you used a palette knife, is that correct? Yes, it's more satisfying. The brush is kind of, the knife you take it and you, I don't know why I like it more, but I rarely use the brush. Most of my paintings are done with a knife. It was not long before he dreamed of studying art in Paris, but his father, a prominent village doctor, urged him to first study a profession. I want to go to art school. My father said, learn a profession and then do your artwork. That way I could have good income. He was a wise man. I mean, when you're young, you don't know what you are doing. You need a father or a parent to tell you what to do. So I listened to him. Being an obedient child, <laughs> I did what he said, which I don't regret. Upon graduation from the Friends School, Hovannis chose his father's alma mater, the American University of Beirut, AUB, with a practical goal of studying medicine. Come course registration day, a last-minute change of heart led him to switch lines and register instead for architecture and engineering courses. He went on to earn a dual degree, a BA in architecture in 1945, and a Bachelor of Science in Civil Engineering in 1946. During summer holidays, he returned to Ramallah to visit his family and continue his art studies with Lambert until her eventual return to Belgium after World War II. Upon graduation from AUB, Havanis returned to Jerusalem, working for the British government of Palestine as an apprentice engineer in the Department of Public Works. In 1948, the Arab-Israeli war broke out and necessitated his quick departure. He returned to Beirut, where he found success as both an architect and engineer, undertaking a wide range of often simultaneous projects that included designing apartments, villas, and furniture. In addition, Hovannis worked from 1951 to 1956 as AUB's assistant to the director of buildings and grounds. I was a supervising engineer. They had a lot of construction. I was supervising the construction. Most of it by the office of McKim, Mead and White. By 1954, he had also established his own successful private practice and was well poised for a bright future in Beirut. In December of 1951, Hovannis would meet his future wife, Hermine Oenesian, also an employee of AUB and an Armenian native of Jerusalem. From the outset, one might say there was a definite spark between them, as from the moment they first shook hands, the lights in the building went out. So we were introduced after work, it was dark. I stretched out my hand, she stretched out her hand. As soon as her hands touched, the lights went off. It was a very dramatic introduction. And that was it. Three months later, we got married. That quick. Their loving and supportive marriage would endure for over 60 years, until Hermine's death in 2013. In the year following the birth of their first child, their daughter Aline, the couple at Hermine's urging registered with the American Embassy to come to the United States. Hermine felt there would be greater stability in the U.S. for raising a family and more opportunities for their children. At that time, it took 10, 15 years to get preference. If you're from Europe, European you get a visa right away. If you're from the Middle East, you have to wait 10 years. But after three months, 
our application was approved because in Palestine I worked for the British government. So I was not considered as a refugee, I was considered as a displaced person. For that there was a special visa. So I was so shocked because I didn't expect that. Reluctant to leave behind the security of their established life and his thriving practice, but having faith in Hermine's vision, the family set off for the United States, settling in Boston in 1956. You said you had an issue with moving to America because life was pretty good in Beirut. Do you still regret coming here? <laughs> no, I don't regret it because soon after we came, trouble started in the Middle East you know, civil war and all that kind of stuff. And here I feel like an American. There I didn't feel like a Lebanese. The Donabedians soon adapted to the Boston area, welcoming the birth of two additional children, David and younger sister Meg, over the next seven years. In fact, it would only be a matter of one week after arriving in the U.S. before Havana secured full-time work marking the beginning of a productive U.S. career that would span the next 43 years. My whole career here, only three months, I was without a job. Even the worst recession, I was always working. I didn't have an idle moment. Those 40 years of being an architect, were you also doing your artwork? I never stopped doing my artwork, never. Doing continuously. Right. Followed my father's advice. <laughs> Beginning as a structural engineer at Stone and Webster, his talent for architecture won out, and he continued on at various prominent firms that included Samuel Glazer & Partners, Campbell Aldridge & Nalty, and the architects' collaborative, TAC, where he joined their burgeoning Abu Dhabi hospital team, developing an expertise in healthcare design. Hovannis then joined Shepley Bullfinch and the Boston office of Cannon, where he retired at the age of 75. Hovannis's major contributions during these years as a project or staff architect include two Abu Dhabi hospital complexes, Boston's Leahy Clinic Medical Center, Long Island's Jewish Hillside Medical Center Children's Facility, Cincinnati's St. Francis St. George Hospital, the review of design development documents for IM Pay and Partners Federal Triangle Project in Washington, D.C., University of Connecticut's John Dempsey Hospital Support Building, and innovative magnetic resonance imaging additions for New England's Danbury and Mount Auburn Hospitals. Throughout his working years as an architect, however, it was always Hilvanus's passion for drawing the human figure and love of life that sustained his art making and was his raison d'etre. Over the last several years, he has completed over 400 color collages on an intimate scale based on drawings from the model. Sometimes you put them together in multiples, like, like this one. I got that one, Andy Warhol, and that's that. I got the idea from there. Is that the same woman posing in different ways? Yes, it's the same woman. You didn't have eight models at no, once? No, no, no. I told her, pose like that, and I, I directed her so that I did the composition. You make it look very convincing that they're in the same room, the overlapping, the size differences, all yeah, that. I don't do this while the model is modeling. I do this later. I have a drawing in my sketchbook. I transfer a drawing to a board like this. I trace it, then go over the lines in the back of the tracing paper, then go turn it around, go over again, and then it's in printed on the paper, so I trace it again. While I have the drawing, and then I cut the pantone paper and then stick it on like a figure. I put this whole color, and then 
exact and I've cut along the edges. So it's transferred to you, then I add the background and all that. It's a long process, so it takes quite a long time. Is the Pantone paper translucent? It has a sticky back under it, translucent, as you said. The drawing underneath, all the lines are under the Pantone paper, they're not over it. How do you avoid cutting into the drawing? Well, exact life are very sharp. All you have to do is touch it and it will cut it. Ah. If you press hard, cardboard is not easy to cut, so hmm. no problem. Would you do the background first or the figures first with the Pantone? I'd do one figure maybe and then decide on the colors, the background. There's no fixed way of doing it. It's a kind of combined. You do one color, then add another color. It's a fascinating process and the results are very beautiful. What would you write on the back of them? I put the name of the model and the date I did the drawing. Sometimes I put what colors I used. So in case I want to use the same colors in the future. And how many did you do of these? I would say about 400, 450. And most of them are Cremena. Her parents are from Bulgaria. She came here when she was eight years old. She still models for me. Most of the collages are of her. She has a nice figure, a nice person. She's an artist herself. She went to Mass College of Art. She doesn't model for me as frequently as before. I have another model now. Did your wife have any objection to you bringing nude models into the house? No, she never objected. In fact, she used to tell people that I draw nudes. She knew that was my passion. Well, her friends used to tell her, how do you let your husband spend time with naked women? Many of her friends used to say that. She quieted them down, I don't know. I had two kinds of vision. One is drawing, for the drawing. One just to look at people. She could tell with what eye I was looking. When bad things happen, you just overcome them. How do you do that? Well, I accept them. I mean, the, not, there's nothing I can do about it. It's a part of nature. There's the good things, the bad things, I have to be able to cope with both. Like two of his biggest influences, Richard Diebenkorn and Henri Matisse, Hovhannes makes art that is beautiful and life-affirming. He is a wonderful human being. Hovhannes has exhibited his work at the Mills Gallery, Boston Center of the Arts, the Armenian General Benevolent Union, and other venues since the 1950s. Hovhannes lives in West Newton, where at 95 he also keeps his studio and continues to work from life. <laughs>